this uh, evening here in central PA. I'm not quite sure what uh, the timing might be because I understand we're pretty geographically dispersed, but uh, it, it's, it's great to have you all with us. So um, let's get started because I know that we've got a sort of a limited time uh, frame here because we'll have other folks coming in um, behind us. So we want to get into the, the content here and um, I'm going to do a little bit of an overview of uh, how we're going to run the session today, introduce our speakers, and then tell you a little bit about what we hope to be the purpose of this particular session. So this session, if you're logged in, is called Embedding Humanistic Values into STEM Education. And I'm joined by uh, a number of content experts, I would say scholars and researchers in this domain. And uh, my role today will be to moderate a dialogue, a conversation about some of the issues um, related to the humanistic values and where and how that fits into STEM education. So let me start off by introducing, I decided to do this by alphabetically and it turns out that rarely do I have two A's uh, queued up at the top, but uh, Robo, we'll start with you. Uh, Roba Abbas is a lecturer at the School of Management, Operations and Marketing, the University of Wollongong, Australia. So nice to have you with us. Uh, you. We also have Ariel Onbar. Uh, Ariel is a President's Professor, School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University. Ariel, I like that background. Uh, we also have Punya Mishra. Uh, Punya is the Associate Dean of Scholarship and Innovation also at Arizona State University. And finally, Richard Pitt. Richard is the Associate Professor of Sociology at the University of California, San Diego. Richard, great to see you again. Thank you for being here. Uh, um, by the way, my name is Larry Reagan. I'm an educational consultant in online and remote learning. And I've had the pleasure over the last oh, year and a half of working with uh, my colleagues here on a particular project that we hope we're going to be able to share a little bit of the outcomes with you today. So we're thrilled to be here and be able to contribute um, a bit of uh, a framework and uh, a little bit of a report on a project that we worked on this summer and into the fall. And I'm going to ask uh, Ario and Quinn to share a little bit of that with us in a bit. Um, Robo, if it's okay, maybe I can ask you to share a little bit of the context of this larger conference that we're participating in. Sure. Thank you so much, Larry. And thank you to my fellow panelists, to the audience members. It's great to be here today. Um, so the PEUN 2020 virtual convening, which has co-located today's program and events with the IEEE International Symposium on Technology and Society for 2020 is primarily about understanding the ethical and other implications of technology in sort of a broad sense, oriented towards really achieving and creating a more just and equitable future. The theme of ISTAS 20 is similarly on public interest technologies and uh, in the lead up to the event, what was really interesting was, was it was an actual honor to, to meet first of all the PUN team, Andrine Sirley and Mary Woodworth from PUN and Katina Michael, the general chair of ISTAS 20, where we had discussions around um, the organization of the program. And it became evident that uh, we had some shared goals and aspirations for this event. Uh, and this primarily included exploring through a collaborative process, uh, one that engages uh, with speakers, members, attendees and other stakeholders, ways in which we can design and develop technology for good and technology that is in the public interest. Marvelous. And, and I have to tell you that really resonates with so many of the themes that we heard uh, coming out of this recent future of uh, STEM education project that we'll get to in a little bit. But thank you for sort of providing that context for us. It really does help. Um, so what we'd like to do in this session are really three or four things. One is we, we want to explore a little bit about what this term uh, humanistic knowledge means. And in particular, sort of this structure that we use, we call it the, the knowledge structure that we use during the workshop. And Quinya in a minute will share a little bit of that with us. Um, also as the um, sort of examples and non-examples of, of how humanistic values may be incorporated into STEM education. Uh, I'm gonna call on Roba and, and Richard uh, to do that a little bit for us. 
Uh, would also like to share some of the outcomes of this project. Uh, Ariel was our uh, director uh, maestro with uh, Punya in this project. And it was a rather large and I'll say complex initiative and uh, they pulled it off magnificently. And um, I've asked Ariel maybe to share some of the results of the projects. Uh, they were the, the interest and response to the project was a bit overwhelming. I'm sure Ariel will yeah. mention that. Um, but also the, the, the level of projects that we received, the level of participation was tremendous. And it's very exciting to hear that. Um, if finally, we'd like to maybe have a little bit of a conversation of where we go from here. Uh, how do we continue considering maybe not only humanistic, but the other variables in the knowledge framework as well. So um, with that, Roba, maybe I can ask you uh, again to share, oh, I'm sorry. I, I use that. I, I already asked you that question about the, the context, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump to Ariel. Thank you, um, Ariel. One of the the issues that that we talked about a lot in the last uh, year and a half in gearing up for this project was sort of the current state of STEM education, and you were very passionate about speaking about why we need to be reconsidering what we're doing in STEM education, why it's so important to us. Would you share a little bit of that with us? Sure, I can do that. Should I, should I introduce a little bit about what this project was, though? Would that be useful? Oh, yeah, that'd be awesome. I, I can do that first. So, so this is a project that uh, was funded by the National Science Foundation, um, which approached me and a group at ASU that then we broadened out um, uh, to hold a workshop. Uh, originally was conceived of as an in-person workshop um, about uh, the future content of STEM education. What should what should the the uh, what, what should STEM uh, students of the future and students interested in STEM learn about. Um, and this was a follow on to a couple of other workshops that um, uh, NSF had had about the future of assessment and future of learning environments. And they realized they wanted to do something on the future of the actual content of what students should be learning. Um, and uh, when Puni and I started talking about this, we quickly gravitated around a framework that Puni will talk about, uh, I suspect, uh, in, a, in a moment. Um, uh, to infuse humanistic and what we call meta knowledge perspectives into uh, STEM education alongside traditional uh, foundational content knowledge. And as, as Larry said, it turned out that this was, um, this notion turned out to be very interesting to a lot of people. Uh, we were originally gonna do an in-person workshop because of COVID, we had to pivot to an online workshop, which of course had its downsides, but it also had some amazing upsides and that we could, we could throw the doors wide open. And we ended up with um, uh, nearly 180 applicants. Um, uh, we ended up having a workshop of over 100 people, uh, which was two or three times the size we could have accommodated otherwise. Uh, so as Larry said, we were, we were kind of overwhelmed and that was, that was really awesome. So there's a great yearning out there. Uh, and this was particularly from STEM education professionals. That's who most of these people were. They were mostly faculty who teach STEM subjects like me. Um, I'm not an expert in pedagogical theory or anything like that. I'm a geologist and chemist who teaches uh, these subjects. Uh, at the college level. And as Larry said, I've become pretty passionate about the notion that, that uh, the way we teach STEM is, is too narrow. Uh, we teach um, in general um, in silos. Uh, STEM students, if they do learn anything outside of STEM, it is in a distribution requirement kind of mode. It's a checkbox sort of thing. Um, it, it's not taught in any way that actually integrates. And I think this is, this is doing a disservice both to our STEM students and to the wider society because I mean, you can go into this from many directions, but I mean, from one of them, you know, you, you major in chemical engineering or you become a doctor, whatever it is, and you go out in the world and you think you're doing this in order to affect change. And what you quickly find out, I think, is that to actually affect change it requires more than simply being an expert in your field. It requires a whole bunch of things that are beyond that. Um, that's just in terms of your person, but also in terms of what society is looking for and how it values your scientific knowledge versus other forms of knowledge versus other perspectives. You know, if you aren't trained more broadly than in your STEM discipline or the way that scientists think about things, scientists and engineers and mathematicians think about things, you are going to be shocked, surprised, and dismayed at how um, the world is not so receptive to your arguments uh, because your arguments are only addressing one piece of what people actually care about. And so um, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I think that we, we really need to be rethinking how we educate our STEM students to shape, STEM, shape the future STEM professionals to be more effective in the world. Um, and then if you're talking about people who aren't STEM professionals, lawyers, businessmen, whatever, what do they know about science, right? What, what do they think science is? Um, and 
again, to shape that correctly so that people turn to science for what it can offer and don't turn to it for what it can't easily offer, you need to, again, have a more holistic, integrated approach to what STEM education is so that when they take that one, two, or three STEM classes that they're going to take in, at the college level, um, it's not something that is over there. <laughs> It's something that they understand is here as part of what they need to be thinking about in their legal lives, their leadership lives, their economic business, whatever it is they're, they're doing, that, that, that they have need to see what the integration is, where the boundaries are, um, and, and, and understand what's relevant and what isn't. And so again, those STEM courses for non-science majors also need to be taught in a way that actually draws those connections fairly and intelligently. And for the most <clears throat> part, we don't do that. So that's... Ario, can I... Um... <laughs> This is going to be a surprise question for you a little bit. Uh -oh. I mean, right, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, as you were speaking there, why now? Why do you think, you know, the history of STEM education was such? And now we seem to be at this pivot point to, to considering something different. What do you think is the impetus for that? I think there are many, like any, like any transformation like this, um, uh, there are many factors that's a confluence of things. So I could name a few, right? One of them is, of course, the world is a smaller place. Mm. I mean, there's, there's no doubt about that. Um, within the US context, the, the nation is becoming more diverse, which requires more thought and care um, to different perspectives and points of view. Mm. Um, I think there's also been, maybe this is a little bit more of a personal take, but I think it's probably true. Um, I'm not a historian or sociologist, but, but I think that there has been a, um, uh, you know, science had its zenith, right, in the immediate post-war period. You know, the atomic bomb ended the war, science and technology, engineering, physics, we put, put people on the moon, right? There was this ascendancy of science as, as, as the solution to everything somehow, right? Um, and I think that, that as that worked its way through the society, people saw, well, wait a minute, science isn't answering everything. It's not the answer to everything. And I think most of the society has kind of realized that or intuited that. I think, frankly, STEM professionals, some haven't. It's only our STEM curricula don't quite perceive that, right? Um, and, and so I think there is, we've reached a, a you know, societies evolve. And I think, I think we've sort of reached a, a bit of an inflection point where we realize that what we thought was the answer is not quite the answer. And that leads, I think, to a rediscovery of some older wisdom that you find in all sorts of writings and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and philosophy. Um, and, a re and a need to reinvent that for the modern world and a resynthesis. So I think we're in a, that kind of a, a moment in, in the history of our, the development of our societies, Western society. It's really exciting, um, a little bit scary. And I, and I think it goes back yeah. to the, the need, if you will, to describe and think through intentionally. Uh, and Punya, you gave us a bit of a framework to do that with. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the knowledge structure that we used for the project? Sure, thank you, Larry, and thank you to all the other panelists. Uh, <clears throat> this has truly been an exciting project. And I think there are two aspects I think that are important to think about. Uh, one is the framework, Larry, that you mentioned. And I think the other part is how the workshops, uh, which were actually what we call design studios, uh, were, uh, were implemented. Mm -hmm. But speaking of the framework, and this coming back to the point that Ariel was making a little while ago, which is that these have been issues that we have been dealing with forever. I mean, this is 1890s. Herbert Spencer wrote this essay called What Knowledge is of Most Worth? And his answer was science. And I think this is something that as a field, as a civilization, as a nation, uh, as a, you know, uh, human beings, we need to be revisiting and asking those questions because contexts are continuously changing. So what seemed like the right answer in Herbert Spencer's time clearly doesn't work today. The framework that we used in this was some work that was done by uh, myself and a graduate student a few years back where we got interested that there were all these frameworks for 21st century learning. And we were interested, like they all seemed very different from each other. So we did sort of like a meta analysis. And essentially what emerged were three clusters of, of, of domains, so to speak. One was clearly the jobs of the future or the work of the future will require a strong foundational knowledge. You have to know your math, you have to know your science, you have to know your you know, technology, your engineering. You can't get away without that foundational bit. However, as important to that is how we would learn that and how we would work, operate in the world. And typically 21st century skills such as creativity, collaboration, um, critical thinking are things that people mention in that space. But what was 
Also interesting was the third, and I want to re-emphasize this was not a framework that we created. It was one that emerged from our analysis of around 20 other frameworks. So it's sort of like a meta framework. Mm -hmm. And the most interesting one that emerged is what are sort of what we call humanistic knowledge, which is sort of the ethical and the moral values that we bring to the tasks that we do, to the choices we make. I mean, even if you think about when we design a curriculum, there are a whole range of choices we're making. Which voices are we including? Which are we excluding? Are these, you know, and I know Richard will speak to his work around sort of the nature of identity formation, whether you feel like you are a part of this process or not. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember hearing this one of the former heads of NSF talking about the fact that all the problems that they tackle, like, you know, that solution that emerged in the, in the 20th century are now the problems of the 21st. You know, and, and so the, the, the advent of technology has its own, you know, so thinking about those values. So again, I think the biggest point that we try to make in this that these three are important, but we cannot see them as being separate from each other. And I think what the ultimate goal of the whole studios and workshops and the webinars was to get people to see them as being integrated, that you cannot tease apart that can we develop curricula where you are not saying, oh, go take a class in psychology and the humanities and that should check off your box. Is that these ideas need to be deeply embedded within the curriculum itself. So you, when you're engaged with uh, a course on, let's say engineering or computer science, you are also thinking of the ethical consequences of your decisions, that you're also thinking of alternative voices. You're also working and learning in a collaborative sort of you know, creative, innovative sort of way uh, but again, the, the, the values that we bring become critically important in that. And so in some ways, if you could think about the foundational is what it is that we need to learn, the meta is how we learn, how we approach that knowledge, and the humanistic is deciding what is it, is it that we need to be paying attention to, why? I think it's answering that critical question, which I think very often, given our busy lives and given our disciplinary um, you know, um, blinkers, uh, we tend to forget that. We tend to uh, not ask those questions. So I think it's just an attempt by us to go back to that question that Spencer had asked, you know, back in the 1890s and try to come up with an answer which is more relevant to the times that we are in today. You know, thank you. Thank you, Punya. And, and I, I have to say that uh, having been pretty involved in that project, the, the knowledge structure that we used really seemed to resonate with the participants. It was kind of um, you know, it was easy to, to understand each of the students. And I know as they were going through their projects, which Ariel will share with us in a bit, um, they thought out hard about how do we pull pieces? How do we integrate these three elements? Um, Richard, I thought what Punya just said is a beautiful segue into, into your work, into your scholarship and research. Um, and you, you and uh, Katina Michaels were uh, a guest for us during one of our initial um, webinars where we we're kind of laying the foundation. Would you share with us a little bit about your domain of research? And if I can help um, lead you uh, in, in, with a question is how, why is that important to us as we're thinking about the future of STEM education? Thanks again for inviting me. Thanks Larry for guiding us through this conversation again. Um, so, I always am nervous when I enter these conversations, right? I'm a sociologist. I'm not a chemist or a geologist or an electrical engineer. So, you know, anything I say feels like an easy for you to say kind of conversation. Uh, so I want to sort of give people a little more information about the struggles in my own discipline um, and then sort of walk into this conversation to answer your questions. So in my discipline, sociology, which is often seen as a humanistic science, right? Because some of us ask questions around sort of what's the reason for that behavior, right? What did it mean to social actors rather than just being content with running models and finding causes and predictive outcomes? Um, and yet in my discipline, pretty consistently since its origins, we've been having these little battles about how positivist we can or should be, right? I think we have some uh, science envy, if you will, right? Where we wanna be like geology and physics, where there are natural laws and universal truths uh, that we can apply to people like other scientists do rocks and stars and zebras. 
Um, and so I think we, we keep landing in these conversations where we think it doesn't matter what your race is or whether or not you're religious when you do science. Why should that impact the questions you ask? Why should that impact the analytical lens you use? Why should that impact the lessons you learn from your scientific research? Um, the other side of this is that it also suggests that we don't have to think about those things, again, race and gender and religiosity of other people when we actually engage in science, right? And so you can see this in some of the natural sciences more clearly than uh, in the social sciences, right? Where it's like, why should I care about environmental justice or environmental races, racism as a civil engineer, right? Why should race matter when I'm trying to get people to sign up for vaccine trials? And even if we're smart enough to realize that bodies are socially constructed in these sort of racialized and gendered ways that wind up being scientifically significant and meaningful, you know, people still ask the question, well, why do I have to worry about history when trying to recruit a sample? Why do I have to worry about culture uh, when I'm trying to recruit a sample of Black people, right? I should be able to recruit Black people just like I recruit everybody else. Well, that's difficult if you don't think about the history of the Tuskegee experiments, or you don't think about the longstanding distrust of medicine that exists in the Black community when we look at all the Black women dying, for example, just trying to have a baby. So, so the problem with these approaches, right, this science is positivism where we don't care about anything that doesn't look easily measurable uh, with numbers, um, the problem with these approaches, in my discipline, I argue with other STEM disciplines, is that you know, this approach has some problem, you know, obvious issues, right? People engage in science, and therefore science, what we study, how we value, uh, what we value as science, what we decide, well, that's scientific and that's not scientific, that's worth investigating and that's not. Um, even, and I think this is you know, probably the most frustrating part of this, whose opinions we value as scientists, right? Uh, you know, do I, if, if I have a woman uh, postdoc, do I care uh, what her perspective is as a woman? Why should that matter? Well, it might, uh, partially because we find very consistently that people say, I don't need a woman in my lab um, uh, to do good science. Um, and so what I think the sort of first problem is, right, is that we forget that science is a humanistic exercise, right, that is bound up in meaning making by the people doing science. Um, and then I think the other thing that becomes important here is that everything science produces will interact with the social world at some point, right? And so we have to be able to not only ask the question, can we do this, right, the sort of uh, foundational meta knowledge kinds of things, but really be able to ask the question, should we do this, right? Are there impacts on the social world and on humans um, by our scientific engagement and scientific um, investigations? So we certainly have to be more intentional in our thinking about these ideas, right? Identity and group processes, ethics, um, justice and equity, culture, history as scientific knowledge producers. And learning how to be intentional in that way uh, is not going to fall on them out of the sky, right? Learning how to be intentional in that way starts with our training of aspiring scientific knowledge producers. We cannot, and, and uh, Cunha suggested this, we can't leave it up to chance that students will wander into my sociology of race course or wander into a philosophy of gender course um, or an environmental science course for that matter, um, that they'll learn those things in humanities and arts courses. We can't be guaranteed that's the case. My research on double majors, in fact, shows that when undergrads double major in STEM, right? So they're a chemistry major and a physics major. The first thing to go out the window are social science courses. They just don't quite fit in the schedule. Um, and then right behind that would be humanities courses um, and the arts, right? Because the, the schedule becomes so full of science requirements, again, where people are learning cultural logics around that exclude humanistic values, um, that we can have students go through four years of college with colleges having graduate 
distribution requirements and students not getting much of anything uh, when it comes to humanistic values. But more importantly, our evidence also shows the students aren't as capable of incorporating and integrating what they learned in their humanities classes into their ideas about what science means um, and what science ends ought to be, right? And so, you know, this conversation that we're having says, let's not continue to leave it up to chance that students will be able to construct some coherent view of humanistic values in their science endeavors, right? These dynamics have to be integrated into science education. Again, we're wrestling with it in my humanistic discipline. Um, so you can imagine it's even more of a challenge to do so in the natural and life sciences and engineering, right? The productive applied sciences. Um, these dynamics have to be integrated if they're gonna affect these cultural logics that exist in science disciplines and um, institutional logics in science spaces, right? We have to do a better job and it has to happen in the training in an intentional way um, we have to let go of sciences. We are beyond values attitude um, because you can't be beyond values when you live in a social world where, as I said, you have values and the people you're enacting your science on ultimately um, have values as well. Richard, you used a, a number of words there that really sort of, you know, light, light fires in my brain, you know, the word intentional. Uh, the, the expression that these things, uh, nothing happens within a silo, nothing happens in isolation, things that happen in science have an effect in society, they're all connected and, and interwoven. So thank you for kind of laying that groundwork. Uh, Robo, I know you have a, a background in, in ethics. And I'm, I'm wondering, having listened now to Richard and Puny and, and Ariel, uh, how does ethics fit into this? Because I, I, I can't imagine what we would do with ethics, why we would need ethics in science studies, right? Right, yeah. Um, well, just based on what we've heard from our speakers so far, I was just nodding my head and so much of what each of our speakers, what Richard was saying, what Kumi was saying, what Ari was saying, uh, really applied to at least my experience in, in STEM education. So just to preface uh, this discussion on ethics, I guess I'm, I might um, mention my career just very briefly as an educator. So I've taught across three distinct schools, the first being computing and information technology, the second electrical computer and telecommunications engineering, and now management and marketing specifically focusing on operations, information systems and digital business-based subjects. Now, I only mentioned this experience to highlight what I feel is the main challenge pertaining to the integration of ethics uh, into STEM ed uh, education, which I've observed to varying degrees in my various roles across these three schools and which our speakers articulated so, so well now. Um, some of the points that I will probably cover now, we have already heard of, but I might um, describe them from the perspective of technology and engineering based design and development processes. Uh, so my belief is that the primary, uh, I guess, challenge, and back to your sort of idea, um, Larry, there of would, why do we actually need ethics? And that's a common uh, perception in the STEM disciplines. Uh, my primary belief is that the challenge actually originates from and is then amplified by this dominant mindset in the STEM disciplines that ethics is an afterthought and not a precursor to core technology and engineering based design and development efforts. And um, so what I mean by this is that only when the technological artifact or the system is operational, do we typically think about the ethical consequences and implications and the humanistic values, if we think about them at all. Uh, and this is certainly mirrored in, in some of my research into socio-technical systems design from a human-centered perspective. So we encounter, we encounter similar challenges there. And um, this very mindset around ethics and humanistic values is problematic because it, it's almost like a flow on effect so it unveils additional challenges which are then reflected in a number of decisions those deliberate uh, decisions and deliberate mindsets that Richard was talking about. So deliberate decisions, and that Punya mentioned as well, um, deliberate decisions reflected at the subject and program levels and even beyond. So when students actually enter industry and then belong to specific professions and professional associations, you have this um, uh, cycle that um, just repeats itself. Um, so I might uh, list uh, 
So we've got that common mindset, I think, around ethics. And from that, um, uh, we have additional challenges that stem from, uh, from that particular philosophy around ethics and, and the need for ethics in the STEM disciplines. And, and some of these additional challenges are, in the first instance, the lack of subjects dedicated to ethics and humanistic values in actual STEM programs. Uh, the, the second is really ethics being treated as a minor or a minor component, really, or a bolt on to existing subjects, uh, primarily to satisfy accreditation requirements in a practical sense. That's usually because the accreditation bodies demand that there's some ethical uh, integration in courses in order to, um, to accredit a particular program. And this is something that's commonly uh, observed. And, um, another challenge, I think, is that the study and integration of moral philosophy is often equated in the technical domains to compliance with safety and uh, quality standards or a traditional requirements analysis process where we where we ask the user or we, we um, speculate they tend to be more speculative so we, uh, we're speculative when it comes to the needs of users and somewhat speak on the user's behalf rather than consulting with them and uh, these um, processes of requirements analysis are taught in our STEM uh, disciplines in our STEM programs as well uh, and I might just highlight, there are many of these such examples. I might highlight one more just in the interest of time. Um, so all of these things that I mentioned, I think result in yet another challenge in which the study of ethics and humanistic values is actually considered beyond the scope of STEM education. And that's been mentioned already. Um, and in cases where ethics is integrated into the STEM curriculum, uh, or a STEM curriculum, uh, corresponding lessons are generally taught by educators from other disciplines using terminology that students are not necessarily familiar with. And this makes it increasingly difficult for, for ethics and humanistic values to actually be applied in a practical uh, sense. And again, I can just go on and on in terms of the examples there, but um, uh, so why is ethics important um, is I guess the underlying question here. And I think as, uh, as mentioned by Richard uh, and uh, by Ariel as well, and Punya, I think now more than ever, we need to claim responsibility uh, for the socio-ethical implications of, and the other implications of the technologies and the innovations that we're developing, uh, particularly given their far-reaching consequences. So we spoke about the world being, uh, you know, seeming a lot smaller now. And I, I think our emphasis will have to be on collaborative approaches, on integrated frameworks, if we're going to design and develop and innovate in a, in a manner that's responsible and also in a manner that accounts for these uh, ethics and humanistic uh, values. Thank, thank you. That, again, there's an awful lot there to unpack. And, and what, I, what I've always loved about working with scholars like you is that um, once you get started, you know, you have lots of examples to draw from and you have a lot of inferences and, and, and things to share. And I have about a dozen questions. I'm gonna to try to frame them a little bit. I wanna make sure that we also get to the questions coming in through the Q&A uh, and see if I can tie those together. So give me a second. I'm gonna work one of these in in a second. I wanna go back to Ariel though. And Ariel, relatively quickly, uh, just thinking of time, tell us a little bit about the experience of the, of the program, the project, and what some of the output was like. Uh, you're on mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Yeah, we were on mute a lot when we shouldn't have been. That was that was half the experience. No. Um, so we um, we had you know hundreds or so mostly STEM education professionals there, and uh, who really, as you said, resonated with this framework. Um, and um, it, they came up with a very a great diversity of 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 projects of of concepts. The the notion of the workshop, as Punya said, it was design workshop. The goal was to, um, uh, we broke up the, the, everybody into teams. In fact, we actually, we asked them to apply in teams. So most staff people actually came in as a pre-existing team of three, four or five people. Um, and the notion was that each team was going to just design some sort of a output. It, it could be a degree program, a course, a uh, certificate program, whatever they wanted to do, it had to be something that would be actually training students somehow um, uh, uh, in STEM with uh, an eye towards infusing humanistic as well as meta knowledge um, concepts into, into, uh, into the STEM training. Um, and what emerged were uh, then, you know, uh, 20, um, uh, 25 or so different, uh, different things. We, came, we had degree programs, certificate programs, um, components for courses, full courses, curricular alignments, 
professional development programs. Uh, the one that struck, struck out to me is particularly interesting was a, a tool um, for, uh, or an instrument uh, for uh, uh, ethical reasoning, the ethical reasoning instrument, um, which was a, a, no, a, no, a notion being essentially a sort of a structured set of questions uh, to, for creators of biology courses or programs to ask themselves as a way of reflecting to see if they are infusing ethical considerations into their course or their program. Um, so, so a whole range of different things um, that uh, we're still sorting through and organizing, uh, but all very high quality and really quite amazing. We had, we had this hundred or so people there for a week. This, this was, uh, uh, you know, half a day um, or more each day for a week and everybody stayed engaged. Um, and the outputs are really quite substantive. Thank you. Thanks, Ariel. Um, I, I wanted to jump up just for a second back up to Richard in his domain. Um, and, and as you were speaking, Richard, it kind of triggered a thought in my mind, which is related to a couple of the questions that are coming in. It's sort of a theme in a sense, and that is this question of, of the integration of the humanities and such with, with the sciences, and in particular in the hard sciences. What, um, as you're looking at this as a sociologist, what hope do you have for, for how these things can come together? Like, what's the potential you see as we begin to come forward? You're talking to scientists now in different ways than you might have been, say, 10 years ago. Uh, how does that excite you for the future of where we're going with this? Yeah, so one of the things that, that always tickles me is that... Um, People are applying for NSF grants, training grants, and other things in science disciplines. And NSF and NIH are requiring them to employ a social scientist as part of their team. Interesting. Right? And so I've, I've been appreciative of that move, right, at this huge institutional level, right? You don't get a grant if there is no sociologist or anthropologist um, in your team thinking about what the impact of your research will be on human beings, <clears throat> right? So I've been appreciating that. And again, if that's led by the grant agencies, mm -hmm. um, you know, that forces people to do all kinds of things they'd otherwise say, well, that's not my problem. So I've been appreciative of that. So I, I believe it can be done. I think um, there's some folks who never sort of have to encounter thinking about these things, right? Um, it's the social scientists, for the most part, who have to deal with institutional research boards, right, because we're dealing with human subjects. Um, and so, you know, if, if you are only thinking about the people I'm engaging, I'm doing my research on, those humans you need to be thinking about. Um, maybe there's some value to have chemists and geologists and civil engineers have to go through IRB so that they also have to do some of that thinking about the impact of their work on human beings. So I feel like there's all kinds of ways, right? You all discovered them, Punya and Ariel, um, a couple weeks ago, that people can think about uh, how to make these things sort of get past the usual strongholds, get past the usual gatekeepers who are like, we don't care about that, that's gonna cost money, that takes us away from our ends, right, our goals. I think there's a move afoot, um, right? We're in an international conference right now talking about these things. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, right? I think that the kinds of isomorphic pressures, right? Coercive pressures, mimetic pressures, normative pressures that have caused science to do all kinds of things that 20 years, 40 years, 70 years ago, scientists weren't interested in doing and could not figure out how they could possibly do, right? Um, I think those isomorphic pressures can be brought to bear on incorporating humanistic values and humanistic ideas and contexts, um, both in these ways we're talking, right, in the STEM education space, but also without requiring people to do all the work of re-educating themselves, themselves, right? It's gonna take a generation for us to get enough chemists and engineers and physicists to know the stuff they need to know to feel competent to actually engage students on these questions of ethics and justice and identity, right? And so what is great is that there are people like me who are more than willing to be on committees, more than willing to be guest lecturers in your chemistry course or your math course or your engineering course to just engage students in real ways with the kinds of conversations we're having about STEM, 
mm-hmm. right? About STEM outcomes. Um, being able to have those kind of conversations. That way, this current generation of folks who might feel a little leery about doing this kind of work, uh, you know, you don't have to do it alone. There are enough of us who care about incorporating these values in STEM education. We are more than happy to join you and your students in conversations, again, about the things I said, right? About identity and why that might matter, about history and why that might affect what your science can do and can't do and what the barriers will be to the science projects that you're interested in. And you're highlighting that need to reach across the silos, right? You know, it just doesn't work like this anymore. It really needs to be that integration of ideas. And not only should you be invited into a science class, but vice versa, right? You you ought to have a scientist coming into the sociology classes talking about when, when these things are employed within our society, what does it look like and what are the implications? Back to Roba's point about the ethics, what are the implications for how we think about the design of this? I have a question here from Amanda I want to read to you. And um, I'm, I'm trying to think, I, they, they tell us, you know, in moderating, pick a panelist to direct it to. I'm not quite sure. Punya, I'm going to start with you. So I'm just going to ask you to get tuned in here. Uh, the question is, as an instructor, I encounter non-major students with fairly ingrained anti-science attitudes based in conspiracy thinking. Can't imagine where that comes from. I also encounter North uh, non-major um, students with science skepticism due to personal or familiar experiences of uh, medical racism. How do you apply your, your approach to these types of students? We talked a little bit about, Richard just spoke about, you know, the, 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 fan, the funding agencies beginning to change and thinking about this, but we haven't talked about the students. Uh, and Punya, can I start with you as a response to that? And maybe we'll hear from the others. Sure. Um, you know, I think uh, there's sort of a side discussion going on even in the chat here, where I think Richard pointed out the variety of reasons why students come into science uh, courses, and that we have to see it, understand where they're coming from. And I and just uh, now speaking to sort of Amanda's main uh, question. So it's not that it again, we cannot address these beliefs or ideas that students are coming in with unless we confront them. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, there's a lot of research on sort of the kind of misconception that students have, right, about, about basic physics and so on. And what has been clear from that research is that unless and until you can pinpoint to students what the consequences of those misconceptions are, mm-hmm. there's no way you're going to change their minds on these things, right? And that there are lots of pedagogical moves that one can make, but foundationally they have to do with conversation and dialogue and listening and you know and, and persuasion so all a range of techniques which we have to sort of bring into our classrooms um, that uh, misinformation about science is rampant either because of conspiracy thinking or because of as Richard so eloquently you know described of histories mm-hmm. of entire groups of people who have been um, you know disadvantaged, often very deliberately so, uh, which leads to suspicion, right? Uh, But unless and until those things become a part of our curriculum, you know, there's some fantastic research to show that, you know, this is really interesting. Like this is fourth graders being taught about the atomic theory. And this person did this research on them and showed that they could explain, you know, or answer every question that you ask them till he asked them one question, like, do you believe it? And they said, no. So, which means they understood the thing inside out, but they're like, there's no way stuff is made up of these invisible things, <laughs> right? And so I think that's, I think, and so in order to get there, it's much more than factual information. Mm-hmm. And I think that that to me is one of the sort of key reasons why these three kinds of sort of domains that we are speaking of become critical. We have restricted ourselves predominantly to the foundational as I think Ariel mentioned or yes, in previous conversations, uh, that we have put some attention on how teaching in STEM should be done. So we have more project-based learning, we have more collaborative projects and so on, but somehow this third component as to why we should be learning it, why it is important, what consequences it has for our lives and how we can ask questions of science as well, right? And the decisions that we make and think about sort of the, the, the consequences, whether 
clear or whether what one calls the adjacent possible, which is things that one cannot even predict. How do we even think about these things? And so again, Amanda, I don't think there is a simple answer to this, but I think the critical point is that unless and until we bring this into the conversation, it's not going to change anybody's mind. I suspect I, uh, each panelist would like to respond. Ariel, you actually have your hand up, so you, you get to I get have my hand up, yeah, I thought about it. First, at first, I was glad you asked Punya first, but now I, then I thought about it. So, you know, you know I, I teach about uh, Earth history and the planet and climate. So climate science is something that I deal with sometimes. So climate denial, of course, is something that, that I think about. So I'm, I've been kind of struck by um, something that I learned from uh, Catherine Hayhoe, who's a evangelical Christian climate scientist and who has made a large part of her her career now, uh, uh, outreach and education um, uh, around climate science with evangelical uh, uh, communities. And, and you know, her advice, and she has a very nice write up here that I'm just glancing at over here to just refresh my memory. Um, you know, her advice is that to, to approach teaching climate science to communities that, that are resistant to it, you know, you don't begin by talking about climate science. You begin by finding something that you can agree on. Right, you find something you agree on where climate is relevant, and then you move into climate by connecting the dots, right? But you ground the conversation in something that's agreed to. Now, when you ask about well, what what do people agree on? I mean, ine inevitably, then now you not maybe not inevitably, but usually more often than not, you're in the realm of values, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you know you care. We both care about the uh, future of our kids. Mm -hmm. You know, let's have a conversation around that, and then well, uh, you know, how does climate start to impact that? So that's a value-laden conversation, right? I've root, what I've done is I've taken this objective fact-based thing of climate science and I've rooted it in something we care about mm -hmm. and that we agree we care about. And then the conversation becomes very different, mm -hmm. right? And, the, and so I think, I think that's probably generally true in terms of anti-science attitudes, right? The person is talking to you because they, they care about something. Mm -hmm. That's why you're having the conversation in the first place. Probably if you dig around a little bit, you'll find that there is a shared caring, a shared basis of, oh, we both care about this. Maybe we disagree about how science impacts it, but let's let's begin the conversation uh, with, with figuring out what it is that we agree on before we get into the nuances of what we disagree on. You know, and, and I appreciate your comments in the past about first dealing with people as human beings, and, and that's what you're speaking. Right. Let's find the thing that connects us as human right. beings, and then we can deal with right. this. Uh, robot, so you're almost inevitably you're almost inevitably then in the humanistic space, right? Hey, there you go, right? right. Perfect segue. Thank you. Roba, just a, a response to this, but I wanted to ask you to respond to a second question, if you would, as well. Do you have a thought you want to throw into this particular topic? Uh, I think just to sort of second some of the thoughts that um, uh, Punya sort of uh, mentioned around the way in which we can do this is there's no easy answer, but I think informing students and engaging in consultative processes is the way to go. And, and Ariel mentioned the really important term value and value laden. And I guess I think um, uh, perhaps an appropriate way forward where there's skepticism or resistance uh, to these ideas and these values is to engage in consultative processes in which the design of the uh, curricula uh, um, is, uh, is achieved with students for uh, not um, not for students, which is the traditional approach, right? So um, engaging them in uh, value sensitive design in value based design processes, even around the structure of courses and, and empowering them to have a say to um, into how to actually develop access points where it, there is that skepticism and that resistance. And, and I think I'll, I'll um, stop there as Richard, I think had a point to make as well. Yeah, so, so again, what we don't want to do, I think this is the challenge is putting on to faculty more stuff that they have to learn so they can get right at it, right? We're about to hit the iceberg here. Um, and so some of it is like helping people figure out where the lifeboats are, uh, not spending so much of our time trying to figure out how to avoid the, the iceberg. I think we all encounter people who have learned everything they've learned through a Twitter argument, right? Through an Instagram argument, through a series of Facebook comments. Um, and I have come to realize that, well, I'm not gonna teach you anything. You know, I feel like I was in a conversation, an argument, quote unquote, the other day with someone where it's like, I'm not gonna convince you of something in, you know, one minute, a couple of interactions it takes me 15 weeks to teach undergrads, mm -hmm. right? And so I think some of it is being patient with students 
and earning their trust, right? That, you know, just like doctors have to earn the trust of patients who come in saying, I think you're gonna kill me. Um, faculty forget that we have to earn the trust of students that our agendas and embedding humanistic values in STEM education is an agenda, right? I think uh, we have to figure out how to earn the trust of our students so that they uh, are willing to put their heart and their minds and their lens on the world, um, you know, risk losing some of that um, because they know that we won't destroy it in our fervor to apply our values, again, values around justice and values around equity and values around ethics, et cetera, um, into them without sort of doing what we've been talking about, which is taking into account, they come into these spaces with orthodoxies mm -hmm. and our job, just like helping under students understand if you drop a ball, it's not likely that it will float into the air, but we can find a context where it will, right? We have to be able to do that work and recognize it takes some time to do that work, just like it takes time to teach somebody organic chemistry. You know, this is maybe a, I don't know, I'll say an odd observation, but I'm just wondering uh, or thinking to myself how important the concept of trust is in this whole dialogue. I trust you as a scientist that you're not going to uh, push concepts on me that I might not be able to handle just yet. You're going to trust me as a sociologist to accept and understand. You know, it's about that, uh, Ariel's comment about, you know, connecting first as people, building up that trust level to say, I, I may not change your mind, Richard, on that topic, and you may not change mine, but let's have the dialogue about it. Um, Robot, the, the question I wanted to float past you was an early one we got, and we're getting lots of great questions here. I'm, I'm sort of struggling to, to keep up with these, but it was from uh, Shatibo, who asked about the um, institution and government funding agencies not valuing some of the humanistic studies, some of the social sciences, as much as the sciences. And we talked a little bit earlier about, you know, the, the issue of getting students at least an open mind to some of these concepts we're talking about, the, the sciences and understanding and exploring, even if they're not a science major. What do we do with our administrations? How do we help bring them along in this discussion to, to figure out this is really important stuff? I think the funding, particularly in this current climate, is a discussion we've been having quite a lot um, over the past few weeks it's a, uh, and months, actually. It's a great question, by the way, and one that um, we can answer in a number of ways. I think um, at an institutional level, and something perhaps we haven't addressed yet, is the connection between research and teaching, so the research teaching nexus, and the interplay between those two areas and where uh, funding and institutional frameworks are concerned. I think it's making a case beyond the multidisciplinary, even beyond the interdisciplinary through to a, a transdisciplinary view. So um, transdisciplinary projects. So let's, let's unpack those three terms. So multidisciplinary, you get a range of diverse disciplines. They comment about their respective opinions and provide commentary about, let's say, embedding humanistic uh, values and ethics in STEM. Um, that's great, that's a starting point. Beyond that, let's think about interdisciplinary, uh, where multiple disciplines again come together uh, uh, towards achieving a unified objective. So we're getting better and refining um, uh, refining these projects and refining, refining um, our endeavors uh, in order to integrate in a better fashion ethics and humanistic values again. Although granted that interdisciplinary is more suited than multidisciplinary, but even beyond that, um, the transdisciplinary, where you have the STEM disciplines, you have the social sciences, the humanities, the arts, law, education, and so on, collaborating not only uh, in, a un in terms of achieving a unified objective, but beyond that, the development of new theories, methodologies, and frameworks to address the challenges associated with this integration. And I think that's the only way it will, uh, it will work. At the moment, I'm involved in a, in a few projects that are attempting to achieve this, and, and we're not quite there yet. But I think when the case is made, of having these uh, multiple perspectives working towards the goal uh, of, or the unified goal of developing new frameworks and so on, that's, that's perhaps a, a good starting point. I'm not sure what everyone else thinks about that. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thank you. So I'm watching our time, we're down to three minutes and I, I wanna throw a question out for the panelists and let whoever respond. 
why is this important to society? Why, why this dialogue? What, what does this mean to us as we look forward uh, in three years, five years, 10 years? What's the impact? Well, I mean, I mean, at some I, at some level, it's obvious, right? We want to create scientists who are not decoupled from the other important dimensions of the world, um, so that they can be more effective in the world. I mean, from as a scientist, that's the way I look at it. Um, I imagine if you're, uh, I mean, it'd be interested to hear perspectives from from other directions, right? Because a scientist, of course, the way to think about it is how can science be more effective in the world? So, so that's that's a, it's a very it's kind of a tr almost utilitarian reason for wanting to do this. I suspect there are better answers or answers from other perspectives that would be useful. And... No, that's, a good, that's a good, that's a good lens, uh, Richard. Uh, but it's only, but it's only one lens. And I think, I think, I think truly incorporating the humanistic, <laughs> truly incorporating the humanist, humanistic perspective is to realize, oh, that's only one lens on this. There are going to be others. Great point. Yeah, for me, one, len one, one benefit of this is that science is better, right? So it's not just that scientists do better, but science will be right. better, right? Um, we find in our research on double majors that when we couple, when students couple a STEM major with a humanities major and an arts major, they are more creative scientists, right? They are more thoughtful scientists. Um, and so we are convinced that if we, if students, again, learn to engage this other part of the mind um, and these other dynamics entirely in terms of sort of thinking about learning processes, um, that ultimately the science will be better when it's, you know, period. But, and again, that would be the science done by white cisgendered men um, will be better. Um, but we also argue that as we think about these things and spaces become comfortable places for people who aren't white cisgendered men, um, because the values of these other folks become important in the training, not as this extra thing that I have to think about, but nobody engages in the classroom. Um, that folks will actually stay in the disciplines and their very presence will change and make science better. So it's both uh, expanding science's ability to be creative by actually thinking about some other things, but also by having other people in the space thinking about those things. I love that the two of you took it from a different lens. And that's a great way to sort of uh, wrap up our program today. Thank you so much for your energy and your and your mindset here. Very interesting conversation. I feel like we can go on for hours, but I, I know we need to end. Uh, so with that, I sign off. Uh, thank you all for participating. I do apologize. We didn't get to the list of questions. They're great questions. Uh, maybe there'll be future opportunities, but uh, thank you all. Thank you for having